Hey guys, it's Tank Runner. I've written this script countless times and I have no idea how to start this video, so here's what I'm gonna say. I am a team of only one man and I'm going to attempt to make a video game from scratch. The only experience I have is playing too many video games and hating most of them. My hubris is unmatched, so my ideas are gonna be massive, ill-advised, and mostly impossible. And the only help I'm gonna get is from a Discord filled with people who f***ing hate me. If that sounds like the kind of car crash that you can see coming, but for whatever reason you just can't look away, then please sit down, get comfortable, and f***ing strap in, because in this series I am going to be documenting every single aspect of this journey. Concept to artwork, mechanics to gameplay, programming to, hopefully, a finished product. Now, I've had several ideas for games in the past, all of which are way too complicated for a first game, especially for one person, but I'm not gonna choke up on the reins now. If I have to reel myself in later to make things function properly, then fine, but it's never a good idea to hamstring yourself at the beginning. Just let your brain do its thing. I landed on a Monster Hunter game, something like Pokemon, Digimon, Temtem, but we're gonna need more than that to go off of. We don't want another Pokemon clone, and I think we can all agree that there's way too f***ing many of those as is. The skeleton of our game can be the same, but all the meat has to be new and exciting. We could talk about what works and what doesn't in some of those franchises later, but right now I want to take a minute to talk about our demographic and how it's going to help us stand out in the long run. A major flaw that I see in a lot of modern media is that they believe that their demographic is the only one that will interact with their project, therefore is the only one that matters. In fact, some creators will throw every other demographic under the bus if they think that it will keep their target audience around for longer. Then they sit around being shocked when their property shits the bet. Let's go over some examples. Pokemon was created in 1996, which means there are people in their 30s who grew up with those games and still love them. But Game Freak doesn't care about them. In fact, with every new generation, they simplify mechanics, dumb down dialogue, and make the plot more flashy and outlandish in hopes of grabbing up a slightly younger audience, making it harder for older players to take the franchise seriously. On the other side of things, Fortnite was created with children exclusively in mind. Every decision made is to make the game more appealing to children so they'll sneak into the other room and steal their parents' credit card. But there's nothing there to make that game less fun for adults either. A game doesn't need to be f***ing Call of Duty shoot -a man to be entertaining to an older audience. And that's not even taking into consideration all the morons online who say shit like, Well, it's a baby show for babies, what did you expect? My favorite examples of how wrong these heads are is easily Avatar The Last Airbender. An animated show starring a cast of children on Nickelodeon, a channel that, at the time, was airing shit like this. Oh, so good, Tanya. Don't worry, Parker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I wrote this script a while ago and I totally forgot about this, but in this part, it just says parentheses, Mr. Meaty Clip, any of them. It literally doesn't matter. <laughs> They covered heavy topics and darker themes, the animation was amazing, and the writing, for the most part, was on another level. It was very clear that kids would be the ones predominantly watching the series, but that didn't stop them from making a f***ing masterpiece that could be enjoyed by anyone, regardless of age. This is the vein I want to stay in throughout development. We are making a good game first. We are aiming for a demographic that might be older than all the other monster tamers, but that's not gonna stop anyone from picking up the game and having a good time. Sure, a parent could decide to not let their kid play our game. Like, I knew a kid who wasn't allowed to watch Shrek growing up, you know what I mean? If they want their kid growing up jerking off to the bonus features of Shrek 2, that's their f***ing prerogative, I guess, is what I'm saying. We're going to trust the player's intelligence. That means not talking down to them, leaning heavier into RPG elements, and not shying away from darker themes when they're warranted. Whatever's gonna make this game and its story better, that's what we're gonna do. A week or two ago, I made a specific chat on my Discord to discuss the game, which will remain open throughout the entire development process. So if you wanna be involved in the project, make sure to leave comments on the videos or head over to the Discord. The first thing that I asked everybody was to list all of the things they could think of that make up your standard monster tamer, and here's what we came up with. The list was sort of all over the place, and a lot of the things on the list were closely related, so I ended up condensing everything down to this. With it all laid out like this, it should be easier for us to tackle each topic one by one as we work on the game, and it should also give us the added benefit of some much needed structure in these videos moving forward. I'm gonna try and work general to specific here, so let's start with the setting of the game. Now, fair warning, this is gonna be 
dense. Some of you might remember Elden Guard, a world I created a few years ago that I used for one of the first episodes of Drawing Roulettes and World Building. I feel Elden Guard will fit the game perfectly, allowing for medieval elements, darker, more mysterious environments, and a blend of magic and machinery to allow some pretty interesting technology that could benefit the player in bridging the gap between them and all the deadly monsters they're going to be fighting and attempting to catch. Here's a short monologue from a person who lives in this world that I wrote way at the beginning of all this to keep in mind while creating Eldengard. It really helped me stay coherent and stuck to the mood that I was going for. Eldengard wasn't made for us. Everyone comes to that realization. But we're here. Nothing can change that. We can't give up and let fear control us, for the beasts will always be there whether we fight back or not. The aristocracy of Troika says that their machines will save us. That it's just a matter of time before they're able to clear out the mist and level the forests. Even if that's true, it isn't happening anytime soon. We can't wait around for a savior. Amongst the unforgiving terrain and the merciless weather, the endless onslaught of disease and famine, the monstrosities and abominations that lurk just past the tree line. The scorched earth of the Vrathian Empire and the cutthroats willing to kill to make it one more day in a world ravaged by war. We must do what we've always done. Survive. Now, not a lot of this is going to remain relevant to our story, but it's still important to cover all of this in more detail to understand how the outer world might affect our characters indirectly. Elden Guard is a high-tech, low-magic fantasy world where people are just as likely, if not more likely, to carry a sword instead of a firearm. The people who live here have come to terms with their home being a supernatural place, filled with horrific monsters and witchcraft, and they're forced to use their large numbers and ingenuity to stay alive. People have built powerful machinery on Elden Guard, but people either don't trust the technology or the intentions of the people who made it. It was created to fight back against the dangers of this world, and those dangers reside predominantly in woods, forests, mountains, and a supernatural anomaly known as the Mist. This strange, otherworldly fog will roll in without warning, completely engulfing anything in its way, and release eldritch abominations on the covered area. Very few people survive this experience without protection and fortification. And, um, living here fucking sucks, man. But, but, this is what normal is to these people. So they keep fighting and they keep pushing, and sure, some people in this world are going to be permanently sad and pissed off all the time, but others are going to try and find happiness and joy wherever they can, even in the smallest of things. And that's the most important part here. The world is dark and scary, but also beautiful and inspiring. We're gonna scale back now and talk about the specific setting of the game, an island to the northeast known as Land's Edge. As you can see, Land's Edge has a fairly odd formation. Countless years ago, a meteorite struck Eldengard, leaving a rippling effect caused by the crater. The meteorite carved into the earth, burrowing deep underground. The island itself being created by displaced stone and the impact's immense heat. As time moved forward, groups of pirates and swords sailed up the coast from Dreadmire and discovered Land's Edge, and the impossibly deep cavern at its center. Not much is known about these people, except that they grew infatuated with what they referred to as the Hollow, eventually creating a labyrinth of twisting tunnels and underground structures. Jumping forward to today, this civilization is completely gone, leaving behind only traces of what they had built. Maybe they finally made it to the bottom and were unhappy with what they found. Or maybe there are some things in this world that aren't meant to be found. Land's Edge is now home to a small city called Emeralis, which is filled to the brim with descendants of many well-known adventuring families. These families have made a career of traveling down into the hollow, searching out relics of this now lost society of Delvers, and digging up shards of the meteorite, which the outside world has realized can be processed in such a way to act as a conduit for many types of energy and magic. But the Hollow is not a safe place. In fact, it takes many years of preparation to even step foot inside, and that's not even taking into consideration that the wildlife in the Hollow has mutated and evolved unlike anything else in Eldengard. 
So, to give themselves a fighting chance, these families have begun a long tradition of taming these creatures and using their incredible abilities to aid them in survival, traversal, and combat. These beast tamers now carry an air about them wherever they go. They are not just fighters and scavengers, they're heroes. And the culture of Emeralis reflects as much. Most young Emerellians train and go through schooling for many years in hopes to someday enter the Hollow. Outsiders who have mastered the beasts of Eldengard occasionally travel to Emeralis to take a stab at taming these rare and powerful monstrosities. Those who do not wish to risk their lives in the hole regularly hold parties and partake in festivals in honor of those who do. Tournaments are held to show off a tamer's prowess, facing off against monsters and sometimes other tamers. Those who rise up through the Beast Tamer ranks will be given discounts by merchants, higher priority quests, bigger payouts, and will even be treated as celebrities by other citizens of Emeralis. I know that was a lot, but I feel like at this point, you should be getting a pretty good understanding of how this setting works and how our game is going to fit into all of this. The player will be one of these up and coming beast tamers. The goal of the game is to collect relics and meteorite shards to sell, tame monsters, battle other tamers to rise up through the ranks, gain fame and fortune as a hero, and to eventually travel to the bottom of the hollow. We can go into further detail down in the comments, on the Discord, and as we release more videos in this series, but I want to take time to cover the last two topics in the section of this list. Gyms aren't going to be in the game, but they'll be replaced by the occasional festival or tournament where the player will get the chance to defeat several tamers who sit just above them in rank, or to face off against one particularly skilled tamer to pass multiple ranks at once. Outside of these specific events, I want tamers to be out in the world. So you'll have to either track down the people who sit above you and battle them to take their spot, or you'll have to prove your worth as a tamer in other, more dangerous ways. I'm gonna save talking about the monsters for another episode, but before we wrap up on the concept and setting video, I wanna talk more about the Hollow and how that's going to function. Obviously, because we've locked our game to a small island, the biomes available are going to be limited, uh, but we're gonna solve that here. While traveling deeper and deeper, I want the player to experience a myriad of different locales and strange environments. The further they go, the more unnatural and affected by the meteor the land and its creatures have become. Now, if any of you have ideas of zones to be found in the Hollow that would pique your interest, let me know in the comments below, uh, even if they don't make logical sense to be miles underground. Remember, the meteorite could have done impossible things on impact, and who knows what forms of life that rock could have been carrying that have been left undisturbed for millions of years. I think that open-ended question is a good place to stop for the day. And in the next episode, we'll go further into detail about Land's Edge, we'll talk about some of the catching and taming mechanics, and we'll start covering the good shit. The monsters. Just as a reminder, if you want to be involved in this project, if you have any ideas and want to pitch them, make sure to comment below or slide over to the Tank Runners Tonks Discord, link in the description. I hope to see you guys over there. But until then, thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.